Good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Lisa Stromquist. I'm the um, coordinator for quality and patient safety programs at CAFC. And I'd just like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I just want to give you a little bit of information before we get going. Uh, just to let you know, uh, when you come in, your all the lines are muted as you come in. That helps us when we're recording our presentation. There's no background noise and there's no um, no distractions for the speakers and for the people listening. If you have questions to ask during the presentation, we encourage you to uh, type them into the control panel. There's a question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, you can type them in at any time during the presentation, and we will uh, conduct the, the Q&A at the end. Um, uh, also, at the end, we will make every effort uh, possible to unmute lines uh, for a live chat. We can unmute uh, one line at a time if uh, you are dialed in on your telephone or if you have a working mic and speakers on your phone, uh, you can participate in the live chat if you have some questions or comments that you'd like to share. We will be having some poll questions as well, so some questions for you um, throughout the, um, uh, this presentation this afternoon. And as those come up, we'll, I'll give you uh, instructions on, on how to uh, work through those. It's very simple, multiple choice questions. You click on the answer you like. So um, I'm just going to pass you over right now to Elaine Orbein, CAFC's President and CEO. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Lisa said, it's our pleasure on behalf of CAFC to welcome you all to our inaugural uh, nitric oxide um, teleconference and webinar, uh, which we've entitled Sharing a Vision for National Standards for the Use of Inhaled Nitric Oxide. Um, just from our registration list, I know that um, many of you, uh, we have worked together with many of you online and in, uh, in, in facilitating some of CAFC's national programs, and we're certainly looking forward to building a new collaboration together uh, in this very important area. Before we turn to today's agenda, I just want to acknowledge and thank our uh, two nitric oxide collaborative co-chairs. And uh, they are with us on, online today and will really be leading the majority of today's webinar. And they are Zelia De Silva. Zelia is the Clinical Director of Respiratory Services at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. I want to welcome and thank you, Zelia. I also want to welcome and thank Courtney McGuire. Courtney is the Director of Respiratory Therapy at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And um, I know that both Zelia and Courtney are looking forward to engaging in conversation and in subsequent uh, collaboration with, uh, I'm going to say, with the majority of, of our colleagues who have joined us today. I also want to thank and recognize the leadership of my colleague in the National Office, Lisa Stromquist, and Lisa is our National Coordinator uh, of Quality and Patient Safety at CAFC. Today, um, on today's agenda, what we're going to be uh, focusing on is we're, I'm, going, I'm going to provide just a very few, just a couple of very quick slides um, just to share a little bit about CAFC for those of you who may be newer to our organization. Um, the majority, uh, as I mentioned, the majority of our registration um, for today's webinar really represent um, almost all of CAFC's member organizations, um, but I realize that there may be some individuals who may be joining us for the first time. Um, we're going to identify the issues, the issues surrounding um, the application of nitric oxide and, um, and really focus on the, the vision of developing national standards, clinical uh, standards and indicators. Uh, in this very important area. Uh, Zilia and Courtney are going to lead that, um, that presentation and conversation and focus on opportunities for collaboration, share some experiences from our colleagues at SickKids and Mount Sinai, and, um, 
And in the uh, poll questions that Lisa mentioned, we're going to be turning to you to get a sense of current practice and your experiences of uh, representing our, our different organizations across the country. Lisa is going to um, follow that with, with just a proposed work plan and idea of, of how we can implement this particular collaboration and, uh, and, and introduce us to those who may not be familiar with CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network, um, which we hope will become our virtual home for the work that we're going to do in this area. And again, we'll hear from you uh, through a, a very interactive uh, question and answer period. Just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of CAFC's, who CAFC is as an organization and our strategic priorities, our mission is to support our member and partner organizations through education, research, and quality improvement initiatives all aimed at improving health service delivery for our Canadian infants, children, and youth. Listed before you are really CAFC's guiding principles around establishing programs and activities that address current and emerging child and youth health care priorities, today's topic certainly being one of them. Advocating for transforming health service delivery for our children and youth in Canada we do this by bringing the voice of children and youth to key, um, I'm going to refer to them as influential tables, or to key partner organizations that in fact can help us implement practice change, practice bringing evidence to policy, etc. Partners like um, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, Accreditation Canada, the Public Health Agency, um, of Canada, the Canadian, Health the Canadian Institute for Health Information, et cetera. Just like we're doing today as a third guiding principle, CAFC is very committed to connecting service providers and key stakeholders who share uh, common goals and objectives. And that fourth guiding principle is really all about fostering opportunities for research, brokering knowledge, disseminating knowledge, facilitating educational opportunities, and enhancing information exchange. These are really core principles and cross-cutting themes of everything that CAFC does. I'd just like to point out um, that we are, as a collaborative, uh, we are uniquely positioned to influence system-wide change. And we have been able to do that over the last many years in different uh, key or priority areas of child health. CAFC's membership is made up of 46 uh, member institutions representing um, close to 75 health organizations across the continuum of care. When I talk about the continuum of care, I'm referring to uh, our members, uh, which include all of our 16 children's hospitals in the country, many community hospitals that provide essential um, child and youth health care services to this population, the majority of rehabilitation um, health, health centers and community organizations are members of CAFC, as well as home care provider agencies. So when, when we reference, and, and this may come up in today's conversation, that continuum of care, it's that tertiary, quaternary, all the way through to home care uh, services that, uh, that really defines CAFC's continuum of care. All our work is done through national collaboration with and for our member organizations, our uh, specific individuals, and our partners. Um, and there are many uh, collaboratives that we're going to build our nitric oxide uh, model on, um, uh, models that uh, the CAFC has implemented over the last several years in the areas of patient safety and quality, um, uh, childhood disabilities and rehabilitation, mental health, and um, national benchmarking and uh, decision support. At this point, it is my pleasure to turn the virtual podium 
over to both uh, Zelia uh, De Silva and Courtney McGuire. And, and again, I just want to express uh, our sincere appreciation to you both for your leadership and passion uh, to this very important uh, topic. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Elaine and Lisa. Um, on behalf of Zelia and I, we'd like to thank you for providing the avenue today for what we feel is an important topic. Um, the reason we're here today, which is the topic of nitric oxide, it has been identified by many people at a national level as an area of focus, and certainly one that is important for Zelia and I. Um, it was it was, uh, it was key for us, uh, both Zelia and I, within our own organizations of Mount Sinai and SickKids, to really take a deep dive into our current practice and look for areas of improvement and hence opportunities for efficiencies regarding nitric oxide and its usage within our own hospitals. Uh, but Zelly and I, I would say, are blessed as we are in very close proximity to each other and we, we do share some patients um, by virtue of a tunnel um, and, and we're lucky that we have the opportunity to collaborate on a lot of uh, key issues. Um, the question was how then would we uncover uh, issues that were important to us and extrapolate that across the country um, and together with CAFSI, this is where we really need the input and experiences from all of you on the call today. Um, and together with CAPSI, we've determined the need and, and purpose for establishing a national collaborative so that together our ultimate, our ultimate goal would be to reach a consensus on what we all feel would be national nitric oxide standards. And in doing so, um, we think there will be a natural influence on the following um, we feel this would be a great focus for quality control and ultimate patient sa safety, which is our, all of our priorities. Uh, we're looking to reduce variation in current practice and use of nitric oxide across the country. We're looking to promote the efficient use of inhaled nitric oxide and uh, ultimately uh, this would most likely result in cost savings. I'm just going to turn it over to Zelia now, um, who's going to talk more specifically about her work at SickKids. Hi, everyone. It's Zelia here. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for uh, joining uh, us here today. As Courtney highlighted, her and I have had the opportunity to share our experiences as well as our challenges regarding nitric oxide practice uh, with each other. Today, within this forum, we want to share our own experiences with you, as some of this may resonate within your own um, clinical areas of practice. So, for example, at SickKids, over the past year, a comprehensive review of inhaled um, nitric oxide has been completed. And um, the reason behind that was really to identify potential opportunities for efficiencies and most importantly, optimize patient care and safety. Inhaled nitric oxide utilization data was cross-referenced with patient clinical indicators and adherence to our nitric oxide guidelines at SickKids in regards to indications for initiation of nitric oxide, response to therapy, and weaning. I'd like to take this opportunity um, to highlight that this work was completed through the immense efforts uh, efforts of our RT clinical specialists within our respective programs, as well as through the coordination and uh, leadership of our RT manager, and of course our champions, our key physician leads, our physician lead within critical care, as well as our physician leads within um, neonatology. Thank you to all of you. The following few slides merely um, depict a snapshot of our findings. And uh, though it's specific to SickKids data, a lot, of, um, a lot of our overall findings really aligned with a lot of the work that uh, was also completed at uh, Mount Sinai. This first slide um, illustrates um, the areas uh, at SickKids where uh, the majority of nitric oxide um, is utilized. Uh, uh, specifically within the neonatology uh, program, 
our pediatric intensive care unit, and our cardiac uh, critical care unit. So overall, our tickets within these programs, we have a total of approximately 68 beds. And during the one-year period um, uh, in which we reviewed this data, we had a total of 115 patients with a total uh, inhaled nitric oxide hours of 11,686. And please note that the total of hours excludes our uh, nitric usage within our um, acute care transport service, our uh, diagnostic imaging areas, as well as any time nitric is used within the OR. So our first graph uh, clearly depicts um, uh, the number of patients that uh, required nitric oxide within each respective program, and then as well as the other um, table um, illustrates um, specific to each program the number of hours as well. So overall, um, I had alluded to that we uh, re reviewed the indications for use and the adherence based on our guidelines. And what we found was 27% of the time, patients did not fall within the guidelines for starting nitric oxide. So out of the 115 patients that we had on nitric oxide, you'll see um, based on um, the slide, 84 patients um, did meet criteria for initiating nitric oxide, and 31 patients did not meet criteria for in initiating nitric oxide. Our next slide illustrates uh, the number of patients that responded to a treatment. So there was clear response um, in 70% of our patients. So out of the 115 patients that we reviewed data, 81 patients demonstrated clear evidence of response to a nitric oxide treatment, and 34 patients did not respond to the initiation of nitric oxide. With regards to weaning, this is actually some of our most exciting um, data findings and uh, some information that we'd like to share with you, um, which also aligns with a lot of the work that was happening at Mount Sinai. And it, it really speaks to our weaning practices, um, as you can see within this slide. So overall, out of the 115 patients, 43% of the patients met criteria to wean, but weaning was not um, initiated. So, so 50 patients um, met the criteria to wean, but we didn't immediately um, start weaning the patients. And 65% of the patients, we uh, um, commenced weaning, and it uh, aligned nicely with our guidelines. But when we uh, drilled down this information further, we identified that out of the six, 65 patients that we did uh, commence weaning, we did identify that uh, 23 out of the 65 patients clearly demonstrated a prolonged weaning phase. And I just want to put that um, into context. So that's 35% of the patients who commenced weaning had a prolonged weaning phase, which was contradictory to our guidelines. And if I were to uh, align that with the number of hours um, that this would have an impact, we were um, very surprised to note that this actually aligns with 2,000 hours of our overall nitric oxide utilization. And this is an area that we can certainly um, do a lot of work on as well as a team. So therefore, upon in-depth um, review of all of our data and in collaboration with uh, our work with Courtney and Mount Sinai, so it, 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 there's a clear uh, opportunity for um, improvement. Some of the key areas would be uh, initiating a, a timely wean of uh, nitric oxide when the patient meets criteria. Um, one key uh, piece is optimizing the weaning phase of um, inhaled nitric oxide. So really, so really aligning our um, weaning practices with our guidelines. Again, having a consistent strategy for a daily reassessment of uh, nitric oxide. And our last uh, point may not align with all of your areas of clinical practice, but it's 
If you do work in an organization where you accept patients from other centers or potentially there is movement within your organization, that um, to have a strategy around reassessing nitric oxide upon admission. So therefore, moving forward within our clinical settings, over the past few months, all our nitric oxide guidelines and algorithms were updated, and key strategies were identified for implementation and ongoing success of this work. This was accomplished once again through the immense work of our RT leadership team and our physician leads. And of course, it's also important for us to mention our uh, entire interprofessional team that also includes our nursing colleagues and also uh, the pharmacy colleagues. So moving forward, it's absolutely instrumental to CAPSI as well as Courtney and I that attaining information regarding nitric oxide practice within your own clinical settings, your experiences and successes are absolutely instrumental to the, the success of this project. In order to establish a national collaborative and a forum where we can all work together, it was imperative for Zelly and I to partner and forge a relationship with CAFSI, recognizing that we are all members of CAFSI and we cannot do this alone. Together we have put a shared vision in place. This vision is very simple and stated as such, a vision to establish a standardized approach for the delivery utilization and weaning of inhaled nitric oxide for neonatal and pediatric patients across Canada. This project will have a strong emphasis on quality and safety for the specific patient population that we treat. At this time, we would like to take the opportunity to ask those on this call, our colleagues from across the country, some questions regarding the nitric oxide practice and utilization within your own organizations, it is key for us that we get a sense of what this means for you within your clinical setting. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Lisa, who's going to lead us through the poll question. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to launch uh, one question at a time here. I'm going to launch the first question for you now. So in your clinical setting, are guidelines for nitric oxide consistently adhered to? So you have the opportunity now to uh, choose one of the answers, always most of the time, some of the time, or don't know. And we'll leave the lines, uh, we'll leave that open for a moment or two for uh, folks to uh, And I know that there's probably a couple of people um, um, in a room together, so it might be two or three people answering the question at, at one time. So I'm going to close the poll now because we have uh, pretty much everybody voted. And I'm going to share these results with you. So uh, Zelia and uh, Courtney, do you have any response to those results? So 0% said always. Well, you know what? It's very interesting. I think it aligns a lot with our findings. Um, I think it's excellent that everybody responded. Um, um, I find it interesting that 9% um, of our um, attendees uh, stated um, what guidelines. Yeah, there's lots of room for improvement here when you look at the, the answer to the bottom two lines, the what guidelines and the don't know. So there's, it's, it, it gives us hope for there's room for improvement here. And I think that the zero, um, zero percent, the fact that nobody uh, responded to say that in your clinical setting your guidelines for nitric oxide consistently adhere to, I think our focus and what we want to strive for is 100 uh, percent response rate of that. And just, just for context, um, there are 30 lines that are registered. There's 30 lines open, just for context. Okay, thank you. The numbers for everybody online. So poll number two, 
In your clinical setting, have you identified opportunities to enhance or improve your weaning practices? And I'm going to launch that poll. So give people a couple of moments to answer. And you're very quick this time. So we'll close that and uh, share those results. So that's uh, fairly significant as well, don't you think? So 64% of people said yes, they have identified opportunities to enhance. I think this is excellent data, and again, it really uh, solidifies a lot of the, the discussions that Courtney and I have had, and it's just amazing having uh, the representation of our colleagues from across Canada and, um, and everyone uh, sh sharing with us their, their thoughts. Uh, Lisa, the one thing I'd be interested to know and we might be able to dig deeper into is for that percentage that is don't know, is it because those on the call, this is not their area that they would be responsible for this um, versus um, that it is their area but it's just not a, a, a topic of conversation within that group? Uh, if people have a response to that, they can type it into the question uh, into uh, the question pane and uh, as a response. You can do that as we move on to the next uh, as to the next uh, poll question. So if you if you answer don't know and you you have a specific reason for answering don't know. So for poll number three. In your clinical setting, do you actively discontinue nitric oxide when there are no positive effects of treatment? So you need to put the poll question up. Yeah. There you go. <clears throat> so always, most of the time, sometimes, or don't know. That will speak to a little bit of what uh, Zelia and uh, Courtney found. See if there's similarities there. So I'll, I'll close this poll, uh, but before I share uh, those results, I'm going to share some of the responses uh, to the, the last question. So um, the, the folks, some of the folks that uh, answered they didn't know to uh, poll number two, which I'll go back to here, if they didn't know if they had identified opportunities to enhance or improve the weaning practices, uh, somebody said, this is not my area of responsibility, I'm in the pediatric emergency department. And somebody else said, even if we have identified areas of improvement, have we been able to act on them is sort of a, a, another part of the question. So I'll get back to the results of poll number three. So in your clinical setting, do you actively discontinue nitric oxide when, the, when there are no positive effects of treatment? So I will share those results too with you. So 50% of the people are most of the time. How, how does that sort of mesh with your uh, with your uh, data, Celia? You know was... I think I think it's excellent. It's 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 amazing uh, to see that uh, there is a high percentage of uh, of individuals that will um, implement the weaning practices uh, as soon as possible. Um, it doesn't align uh, specifically to the data that Courtney and I um, have found over the past uh, year. But um, it'll certainly be interesting to uh, drill down because most of the time, and even some of the time, that those numbers are still quite high, and uh, there may be um, some opportunities for um, improvement there. And it'll be interesting to hear more about the um, unique experiences and why those individuals um, answered that way specifically with our discussion. Okay. We'll go to. 
poll number four. So our big question of the day is, do you support establishing standardized national guidelines for nitric use in the neonatal and pediatric populations? So I'll launch that poll. And I think that was, we're pretty much there, so I'm going to close that and uh, share those results now. So 86% said uh, yes, 14% said maybe. So um, I'm wondering, uh, for the folks who said maybe, why is it a maybe? Are there sort of anything that you'd like to, to uh, make sure happens or uh, ensuring that the right people are in the room to make these decisions? What, uh, what's your reason for saying maybe? I think that sort of opens a conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that, would, that, would be, uh, that would be a good place for us to, uh, a good spot for us to bring back to Q&A as well. Mm -hmm. So just mm -hmm. think about that and uh, you can... Uh, talk about that later on. Lisa, I just want to add uh, with regards to this question just for all of our participants. This question was particularly important to us um, as a whole at CAPC as well as Courtney and um, myself as partners um, in this project. Specifically about because though we had um, you know this collaborative idea and uh, bringing it to a national level, uh, we weren't sure if this was something that our colleagues across Canada uh, would also embrace. So I think that uh, seeing that 86 percent of our colleagues online feel that establishing um, standard uh, guidelines for nitric oxide um, is important is actually. Um, you know, excellent, and uh, we are so pleased to, to see that result. Okay, thank you. All righty. Well, I will. I will pick up just um, just a brief part of the conversation at this point to really maybe focus a little bit, focus us a little bit on the how. So how can we, the how um, can we establish our um, nitric oxide national collaboration and, and also the benefits and impact of working together, bringing that one common goal and objective to a national voice. Um, this is really how CAFC, as I mentioned earlier on in, in today's webinar, this is really how CAFC does all of its work. And, ha and we have been working in this manner for more than, more than 12 years now. At an organizational level, the benefits of collaborating, the benefits of belonging to a community of practice really brings increased credibility as part of a knowledge partnership. And that's a very important uh, impact as well as benefit. The collective strength, that one voice to a common challenge and goal that is shared across the country, um, influencing, first of all, effective problem solving, and then that collective influence on practice change and policy. New ideas and solutions always lead to more innovation and quality improvement across the system, which of course impacts the point of service delivery. On an individual level, that collaboration or being part of a community of practice provides an opportunity for each individual to access new knowledge from others' experiences, increases work effectiveness, again, through problem solving, reflective practice. And I think we can all feel a little bit of that on today's call. Provides an opportunity to remain current in an area of expertise. And by sharing that knowledge, there's a tremendous opportunity there. It also leads to, collect, to a collective sense of purpose and belonging. And that, too, is very important. 
as well as potential for recognition, career visibility, and leadership opportunities at a national level. Kelsey uses the following definition of our community of practice. And, a, a, and the acronym, of course, that we refer to is COP. So the definition for us, um, and it's not our definition, but it's certainly the one that we follow. The reference is listed for you there. Our COP is a group of people who share an interest in something and come together to develop knowledge around that topic in order to use it at a practical level. And that really speaks to what we're hoping to officially launch today is a nitric oxide national collaborative. It brings together a group of professionals informally bound to one another through exposure to, common, to a common class of problems, common pursuit of solutions, and through our, through our polling question just now, I think we sort of, you, you can get a sense of what we might direct our, our, our energies toward and thereby themselves embodying a store of knowledge. And this is truly what a community of practice will bring together. Just focusing on the benefits of, of a COP, it brings knowledge to our table, to our virtual table from scientific evidence, as well as knowledge from practitioners' experiences, your experiences. And this is a huge part of getting to that deliverable or the finish line. It is within our communities of practice that tacit knowledge is actively integrated with explicit knowledge. And our communities of practice are considered by many, and I think it's something that, that is utilized as a tool, I'm going to say, as an ideal social structure for stewarding knowledge. Um, at, and, uh, and we really hope that that you will all, um, first of all, share uh, the conversation that, is, that has happened here today with, with your respective communities and colleagues, and really let folks know of, about this opportunity to come and be a part of our, of our new uh, community of practice focusing on um, uh, the use of nitric oxide. At this point, um, continuing on the how, how will we do this? How can we do this together? I'm going to turn back to Lisa to just outline a bit of a work plan building on other models that CAFC has implemented over the past many years now in different uh, key priority areas of child health. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you. So, you know, we've talked about community of practice and collaboration and we sort of use the collaborative and community of practice uh, terms interchangeably here. And um, uh, the communities of practice often, um, we, we, we uh, see them as part of a, sort of our, our virtual world is our virtual community of practice, which I will uh, I'll go into a little bit more. But from a very high level, uh, this collaborative, our work plan is to establish our, we'll start with establishing our steering committee. We have two very dedicated uh, co-chairs already in place who are looking for other members to, uh, to join them and uh, steer this work. And we're going to develop our virtual community on the CAPSI's Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, uh, during this time, we'll, we'll do, uh, conduct an environmental scan. Uh, looking at current practice nationally, look for benchmarking opportunities, uh, maybe nationally, internationally. We'll, we'll look for areas, uh, you know, sort of pockets of, uh, of um, pockets of expertise and and uh, some uh, best practices. We're going to engage other stakeholders and partners, and uh, we have a very aggressive timeline. It's a pretty. We set a really tight timeline, and we we're hoping that. Because everybody, everybody really has guidelines, and everybody's working hard at uh, at this. It's an important issue across the country. That we're hoping that we will have uh, sort of draft guidelines developed, or uh, you know, there's going to through the environmental scan, we'll have worked on validating um, some of the existing guidelines, and hopefully we'll have some draft guidelines by the end of this year, working towards uh, a sort of a pilot implementation coming in 2014. 
So that's what I said. We set a, a tight uh, work plan and timeline to make uh, to move this work forward. So as a steering committee, we won't be spinning our wheels. We will already have set our um, our priorities and uh, our, our goals. So CAFC's role in all this is really one of uh, facilitation and coordination. So we're going to be providing high-level support for this collaborative, and we'll organize um, we'll organize uh, teleconferencing, web meetings, webinars as we're doing today. Uh, 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 communicating throughout through the uh, community of practice through the collaborative, and we're going to promote the value of being a member of this uh, COP, and that will encourage growth and commitment. And you know, through the development of a, a strong knowledge translation strategy, we're going to engage the community membership, and we're going to our our responsibility is to ensure that the community remains focused on its goals and on its objectives and we're going to look at our timelines and see what's what is achievable and we're going to monitor our activities and we're going to celebrate our achievements and we will act as a community's champion and uh, we'll, we will be promoting participation as we do for all of our um, all of our um, programs we'll promote per participation in activities and uh, and um, try to build this community to be even stronger. And again, as we do for all of our programs, we'll provide the Knowledge Exchange Network as our platform for the community. So it's our virtual home. And we work to connect members with each other. As uh, Elaine said at the very beginning, you know, one of our uh, strategic priorities is sort of that connecting and uh, bringing people together. So, when we establish this steering committee, we do already have, we have Zelia and Courtney to, to lead. And uh, we at CAFC will be supporting them and helping them along with this work. So we're looking for a national steering committee. We're looking for, um, for organizations that have, uh, would be using, this is the, where it's going to be a priority for them. So perhaps at the level three in ICU. We're looking for uh, RTs, nursing, physicians, pharmacy, everybody from the team that this affects. So the roles and expectations of the steering committee, well, so just for a uh, you know, sort of practical perspective, there would be monthly teleconferences or web meetings, and we've already confirmed that they would be the second Wednesday of the month, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time, beginning early in May. And so what we want from our, um, our steering committee members is to you're there to represent your organization, so you're going to share knowledge both ways. You're going to take knowledge that you that you uh, gain through the community and bring it to your organization, and you're going to take knowledge, bring knowledge from your organization back to the community. And you'll you'll be that conduit, that sort of liaison, and you're going to identify people, individuals from your organization who can help out with some of the the, the work that you know the. Um, getting your hands dirty sort of work because this won't, uh, this, I'm not going to say this will be easy. This is, this is going to take some time and some commitment. So again, working with CAFC, the steering committee also acts as, as a community leader, right? You're, you're helping to lead this and provide oversight and, and uh, you know, maybe guide the community's purpose, the strategic intent, and you're going to assist in developing and developing the community by establishing and articulating the, our purpose, right? We're going to bring in some new ideas and identify new community stakeholders and potential community members. So you're the folks who will know who needs, needs to be in on the conversation. And, uh, you, you, and you will promote our community. So, uh, and your content experts. So that's, that's one of your biggest roles is being the content expert. Now we've used this format in many, many of our um, programs within patient safety. Uh, we've used it, to, uh, Elaine probably alluded to that before, we've used it in our pediatric opioid safety uh, program, we've used it in, in medication reconciliation. We're using it right now in our pediatric practice guidelines uh, collaborative uh, using communities of practice to to work towards standards in other priority areas. So it is a model that we've used, that we have had success with, and we know that we can count on our community 
to, uh, to support that because we're all working for the same purposes. So when I've talked about our virtual community of practice, and that's our knowledge exchange network. And again, this is the forum. I won't really, we won't, we don't need to go through a, through a tour of the knowledge exchange network today, but I would encourage you to go to CAFC's website and visit the knowledge exchange network. And you can see all of the different categories we have up there. It was, uh, it was originally uh, designed for um, the um, continuity and coordination of uh, care of kids with complex needs. And um, it's a wiki-based interactive online community. And it has a focus on sharing and expanding and creating knowledge for the child and health uh, community, the child and youth health community. And we're, its members include uh, parents, families, um, um, clinicians, administrators, um, other stakeholders. Um, it's, it's a public site, so everybody is welcome to view the, uh, view the information online, and you can apply to become uh, an author online and start contributing information. So this is how we build our communities of practice there. So it includes many categories, as I said, it supports information exchange for many different pediatric communities. And because it's not like a static website, it encourages, it allows for timely revisions to content and allows interaction with uh, authors and creators and allows the community to provide feedback and work together to improve the content. And so this is, this is going to be a way that we can share, share our experiences. Uh, once we, we'll, it'll be a place to uh, be a repository for guidelines that we've found through the environmental scan for information that we'd like to share for tools or for uh, programs that uh, that uh, organizations have in place, you can share any information up there. And uh, then other people can sh uh, use it and comment and uh, working together to improve whatever is, um, whatever is up on the site. So it, it, it has worked very well for many of our programs in the past. So this is uh, how we would like to move forward with this particular collaborative. And of course, um, we at CAFC will provide any sort of training and information on the Knowledge Exchange Network that is required. So we'll just pass it back to Elaine for a moment. Thanks, Lisa. That was, uh, that was an excellent overview. I, at this point in time, uh, just before we really turn to you, to our colleagues across the country and those of you who have taken the time to participate today, I want to acknowledge a very special partner, and that is, and, and uh, we have several colleagues on today's webinar who have joined us from MedBuy. MedBuy has been a partner in patient safety and quality initiatives with CAFC uh, for almost a decade now. Um, MedBuy has very generously provided an infrastructure grant to CAFC to facilitate and support the work that we've described to you today. And uh, um, I, would, I know I'm doing this on behalf of many people, but I really want to extend our sincere appreciation to our MedBuy colleagues. At this point of our webinar, we really, as I mentioned, would like to turn to you. And um, Lisa will facilitate a, uh, a Q&A. And, um, and these uh, traditionally can be very interactive, and I'm going to uh, turn to Lisa to sort of provide that overview of technically how this is going to work uh, in the uh, virtual webinar world that we're spending some time in this afternoon. And then, of course, uh, Zilia and Courtney and uh, Lisa and I will be very happy to respond uh, appropriately to, uh, to your questions. And we really would like to hear from you. So, Lisa, I'll turn things back to you. Sure, just as a reminder, so if you have a question, you can type it into the question pane in the control panel. It should be on the right side of your screen. Uh, I have a couple of things here. So um, from Erica, she says, I work in the pediatric emergency department and I'm interested in the use of INO for procedures short term. Do you have any information about that? 
Um, I don't, so I don't know if, if Zelia or Courtney do or if... I want to clarify that, I mean, um, thank you so much for your question. Um, I'm just wondering if, uh, uh, with regards to the um, medical gas that is in question, we're actually speaking with regards to nitric oxide which is, um, is not used for short procedures with, the, it's not indicated for short procedures within the emergency department. Um, I'm just wondering if Erica's question is more aligned to nitrous oxide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so I have, uh, Erica, you can let us know if that's what you were referring to maybe. Um, So back, at, I have a question about uh, poll number three. So in poll number three, uh, the question was, in your clinical setting, do you actively discontinue nitric oxide when there are no positive effects of treatment? And some people answered always. Um, so somebody asked, for the people who answered always, uh, Share share their strategies, but share their uh, share their guidelines or their strategies for that. So, um, my comment to that is that's part of working in this sort of collaborative way and uh, in this um, in this manner. So, I would hope that I, I don't know who answered. I don't know who answered always. I, I don't have that information. But um, if um, if you are one of those. Folks had answered always for that. If you wanted to, uh, if you were able to share some of that, uh, some of your strategies with us, that would be great. You can just, if you have a written guideline or something that uh, that you use, um, if you wanted to send it off to me, and uh, if it, you know, if it can be shared, um, we, people would appreciate that. And again, so that's part of working within the collaborative is that we. Um, um, we share things. And I know for some organizations it's not always possible to share everything or there's a little bit of a um, uh, th there's a little bit of a process to be able to share things. But these are the things that we need to work through. And uh, somebody actually has a very good question, how to be involved in the steering committee. So what I'm going to do is everybody who is uh, registered for today's uh, presentation. I will be following up with you and uh, giving you a little bit more information and uh, you can let me know at that time um, how you would like to be involved and uh, we will uh, put you on our distribution list and uh, you will start coming to, uh, to uh, meetings with us, I hope. Okay, uh, do people use functional echocardiogram for deciding failure or success of INO. Yes. I could uh, speak a little bit to that as Zelia here. Now, I certainly have uh, my expert colleagues uh, from our NICU and as well as our cardiac critical care, which is uh, Michael Finelli as well as Leanne and of course uh, Dr. Lawson. Um, but I just we do use um, ECHOs, uh, specifically in our neonatal intensive care unit as well as our cardiac um, unit. And a lot of the work that uh, we did in terms of our data collection clearly uh, identified that, that we have used uh, ECHOs uh, in terms of an indicator for the initiation of nitric oxide. Okay, great. And I also have uh, another question here from Mary say, uh, asking, can Toronto SickKids share their guidelines and could all guidelines be posted on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange website? And uh, so that, that would be fabulous uh, if people wanted to share, share their guidelines and if they were uh, able to. Um, we will be doing a, sort of a, a, when we do our environmental scan and literature search, We'll be looking for sort of that gray unpublished literature that probably is uh, many of the guidelines that are used, plus the uh, the published guidelines. So it will it will be um, great if we can start sharing that sooner rather than later. So from uh, oh, Horatio says he's happy. 
to share the guidelines. So to kick it, to kick us off, just to that specific question, and as we begin over the next short while to build nitric oxide's virtual home on the can, um, Courtney and Zelia, could you would you be able to share, for example? Um, the Hospital for Sick Children and Mount Sinai guidelines, and then of course we could begin to build that repository. Um, hi, Elaine. Absolutely. That's absolutely part of our work is once we start moving with um, our how, uh, how we're going to implement the project and move things forward, our key goal is we will be absolutely open and transparent with all of our guidelines and share a lot of our challenges as well as our strategies for improvement because we're um, making many, many successes at SickKids as well as Sinai, so we're hoping to share that. And uh, through the avenue of our steering committee, uh, that'll be our opportunity to share uh, not only the guidelines from SickKids at Mount Sinai, but uh, the successes exactly. as well as the guidelines and strategies from other hospitals across Canada. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I have, uh, this is from uh, Peter Lawson from SickKids. And he'd like to contribute to the steering committee, and he wants, says we need to make sure that we uh, develop a shared and iterative guideline gathering data prospectively. So I don't know. I'm, I can try to unmute you, uh, Dr. Lawson, and, and see if uh, that would be excellent. See if you can. I've unmuted your line, Dr. Lawson. I don't know if you're able to. Uh, if you have a microphone on your computer. And I'm not hearing you. If I could just add to what Dr. Lawson said, absolutely, uh, doc, Dr. Lawson, that's a fantastic idea. Dr. Lawson is, is a key champion with regards to um, all the work we're doing at SICKIS with regards to nitric oxide. He is taking a, a very strong leadership role. He is truly our champion, so we would um, not do this without him. Excellent. And so I have another question from Mary. Uh, for the NICUs, are you planning to liaise with CNN in order to obtain data? I will. Um, I, I can respond to that. And it's Elaine again. We have um, we have had over many years now an excellent collaborative relationship with the Canadian Neonatal Network. So in short, the answer to that is yes. And by way of engaging members of CNN, perhaps on our steering committee, and or uh, in our environmental plans and, and much of the other work that we're talking about. So I'm glad that you flagged CNN because they would be a very obvious um, content expert group as well as um, um, potential members for our collaborative. And Horatia has another comment saying, I think we need to have different groups, NICU, PICU, and CCU. So again, those are things that as a steering committee, um, you know, will be fleshed out and we'll, we'll see how that, I think we, we've talked a little bit about that between the four of us, uh, yeah. Elaine, Courtney, uh, Zelia, and myself about, you know, the construct of all this. So again, it's bringing in all of the content experts and all the voices and seeing how this best will work. So yeah, these are great things to think about. And I think the target has, has been, and just has been stated is the NICU, PICUs, and the cardiac, um, uh, the cardiac care unit is, 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 is probably the, the best starting point anyway. Uh, I have a couple more questions here. So who manages the weaning uh, in most facilities? Is it RT or doctors or nurses who? Uh, um, at Mount Sinai, we've been really looking to make, um, to really have a, a strong relationship between the RT and physician to take this on um, and really be the leaders in determining the readiness to wean and then ensuring that we're actually following our protocol procedures to follow through with weaning. Excellent. So uh, does the Mount Sinai group have indications for nitric oxide use in the preterm infant? I think the sharing of guidelines is very important. Courtney, can you address that or, or begin I'm to sorry. address it? We're, um, 
we'll be happy to share, again, all of our, our uh, uh, policies and procedures as we move forward. Um, we're looking into all the popula patient populations right now ourselves. Um, uh, both Zelly and I, uh, along with our teams, so, I, uh, you know, Zelly has been sending accolades her way to her group. Um, but I have my people that uh, stand behind me and do all this legwork as well. We've been we've been fortunate to be meeting the the uh, we call it our tri hospital um, leadership group that also includes Sunnybrook and ICU and these three groups of us have been really working together to establish these guidelines together. Um, so we'd be happy to share that as we move forward. And Courtney, do you have, I don't know the answer, do you have a specific guideline for the preterm? Um, we use the same guidelines uh, for the entire okay. neonatal population. Okay, okay. So I hope that answers the, that question, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, at this time there are no more questions coming in. Um, I don't know if, uh, Elaine, if you had any other questions or comments, or Zelia or Courtney. Well, I, I think before we before we sort of um, you know bring bring our webinar to a close, I'd I'd really like to for a few minutes sort of turn turn to Zelia and Courtney and just sort of get your just sort of overall thoughts to some of maybe the uh, the poll questions or just just things that have come to mind through today's um, uh, you know webinar as as sort of parting thoughts, things for us to to think about, and then I'm happy to add a bit to that. Um, I think I think as a result of the polling questions, it's very optimistic. Uh, it's kind of echoing what Zelia and I are feeling in our own little world here in Toronto. And really, we we didn't know if we were if it was our own issue that we were having, but it's it's kind of been comforting to see that there's uh, such a strong presence on this call as well as in support of what we want to do. Uh, we took the 86% as a very strong message that this is a worthwhile venue and, uh, and and a thing for us to work on. It's, it's been a lot of work to get us here and we definitely don't want to be doing it alone and um, I think we take great comfort in knowing that there's a number of people that want to stand behind this initiative uh, through the leadership of CAFSI to help us facilitate to do it. So we're excited to get going on the work. Um, like I said, there's a lot of work and, and both of our both like the success for Zelia and I has largely been our group of people that are behind us and we're going to need them going forward, and that's from our own organizations, and we're happy to share. We're all about being transparent, um, but, you know, this is really not about what we've done because we're looking to learn from other people. So I, I'm glad to see that 86% of the people think this is valuable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I echo exactly what uh, Courtney said, and I don't want to repeat uh, everything, but I've been so impressed with the number of um, colleagues across Canada that um, are on the line and have remained on the line throughout this call. I think that there is um, a, a lot of engagement from all of us across Canada. And I think it will be instrumental that um, we really uh, bring in the right individuals, the right champions uh, on the steering committee because that will be instrumental for our success. And it's imperative that we ensure that the entire uh, team is an interprofessional team. Um, and again, as Courtney said, this is an opportunity for us to share some of the work that we've done and the uh, successes of our colleagues within our individual organizations, but also very important for us to learn from all of you in terms of what's working and what's not working and how we can work together to attain some consensus around nitric oxide utilization. Fantastic. So in, in closing, um, I most importantly want to thank every one of our participants for taking the time out of what we know are very, very busy schedules to join us. We're going to take that with the polling questions data as, as evidence that we are representing yet again the community of the willing. This is a, this particular uh, theme and topic is one that CAFSI has been in conversation with many of you for many years now. We know that this is a common challenge and, uh, and that there are common goals within our, within our national vision. And I want to express on behalf of CAFSI that we are very committed 
to facilitating this opportunity to uh, to seek your leadership, your uh, your expertise in helping us, in fact, to to develop those national guidelines. There's many opportunities for us to uh, think about implementing and um, the all important evaluation of, of of new practice guidelines as we go forward. But I think there's um I hope there's a good sense after today's discussion on our starting point, um, our commitment to working together, and in fact, we have together identified a very important area of healthcare and quality improvement um, for this uh, for our for our pediatric population. Um, Zelia and Courtney, thank you once again for your leadership today and for the passion and expertise that you bring to this. Lisa, um, for facilitating uh, a wonderful webinar today, and I think the practical components that you've outlined are very important, and I hope everyone has a good understanding and, and comfort level of how we can achieve this. Uh, I think the next steps are going to be um, we're going to reach out to everyone who has registered to officially invite you to that first working group uh, meeting, which will be held, um, I believe it was May the 8th, Lisa, I don't have that, that slide up, yep. on, on May the 8th, and we will, we will provide you with dial-in information and how we're going to connect. Let us know if there is a particular role that you would like to play and or um, please feel free to share what you've learned uh, today and, and please invite your respective colleagues to come and be a part of this. Today's presentation will be put up on our Knowledge Exchange Network um, so you can direct your colleagues to, to come and, and, and view the webinar just um, just as if it was live, so both the presentation and live uh, live voice will be will be up on the uh, Knowledge Exchange Network. At this point in time, I'm going to uh, I'm going to officially uh, close our webinar. Uh, express my appreciation to all once again identify our uh, corporate sponsor and partner in this particular um, initiative, and and thank our MedLife colleagues and look forward to coming back together again on May 8th with many of you and to keeping in regular contact with everyone who's joined us today. So thank you to all. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us and uh, for all of those uh, who have indicated that they would like to participate. I will be back in touch shortly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, on behalf of Zelia and Courtney.